Welcome to The Scoop, a program that goes beyond the headlines in bringing you current affairs. Catherine Peary refuses to allow success and fame divert her focus on education as she goes back to the classroom looking forward to write examinations. Not even the ABU women bantamweight title is enough to sway her focus. She can bank on the support of her manager who stresses it's education first and boxing second for Catherine. Uh, these are just girls. The best thing we can give you is you help even from the company side that uh, you must concentrate at school. The dust of confusion seems to be settling. The PF remains a divided party in government than ever before. Embattled Party Secretary General Winter Kabimba has made stunning revelations of party divide on tribal lines. Analysts call for an amicable resolution of the Rangos with an admission that the PF will never be the same. After five years of being a commercial sex worker, a young Namibian woman has vowed to help other sex workers by offering them a better life through a project called King's Daughters. Namibia's capital, Vindok, has seen an influx of sex workers in the past decade. Join us as we follow this woman on her journey to make Namibia a better place. I was almost raped by two guys. Um, they picked me up and then both of them wanted to sleep with me, and it was like behind the cemetery. I'm Francesca Piri Banda, and you're watching The Scoop. death experience, a Namibian sex worker decided to turn her life around. Seven years down the line, 29-year-old Maureen Gawasis struggles to help other sex workers through the Council of Churches in Namibia. The Scoop spent some time with Maureen to see how she spends her day now that she's not selling her body for money. This is Independence Avenue in Bindwok, Namibia where 29-year-old Maureen Gavasis worked as a sex worker for five years. I would walk up and down in the street, then my clients would pick me up here. If they get you on street, they will just arrest you immediately without saying anything. Yeah. And then you will be like, you'll pay a fine of 600. Oh, and then the other thing that they will do to you is they will take off your condoms that you are having and then they will beat you up or they will, then they will go and have sex with you. Prostitution is illegal in Namibia and Maureen says she had it rough while on the street. She decided she didn't want to sell her body anymore. I don't want um, anybody to go through what I've gone through. It's very difficult. You might be killed or you might get HIV or something bad might happen to you. King's Daughters is the only organization in Namibia representing the rehabilitation of commercial sex workers. After leaving the streets as sex workers, the ladies get their skills training in bicycle repairing here. And as part of her integration into society, Maureen also got her training from this place. The men who work here help train the ladies in bicycle repairing skills. Maureen says her work is easier because the men are helpful. Okay, um, men who, who we get um, who is working with us here, they also know our background and they have been sensitized about cause uh, about us and um, they've been told that um, they, they they just got the job because they have to help us like with heavy stuff whenever we get stock then they have to help us to load off and so on 
founded in 2006, King's Daughters Organization is being run by Esma Kingston under the auspices of the Council of Churches in Namibia. Esma says a group of sex workers approached her, saying they wanted to be rehabilitated. There was um, five, six sex workers, female sex workers, who decided that they do not want to sell their bodies any longer. They want to um, come to CCN, this, this place where we are, the Council of Churches, which represent the church in, 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 in the whole um, of Namibia. And they came here to ask for help because one of them, the lady who initiated the idea, she felt pregnant on the street and realized that she couldn't raise that little child on the street and the, that she needed help. Um, when she shared her idea with the rest of the ladies under the bridge, they said, but we also want to make a change. Let's go together. How are things here? Let me greet you, African way. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you. So, how is things here? Uh, we are doing well. Okay. We are just having few bites of the clients, the ones with the favors belongs to the clients. Okay. Um, Esme has to ensure that the bicycle shop has enough bicycles to be worked on, as it's the only way the organization can pay wages to reformed sex workers working here. They are just ready for sale. Maureen only works at the bicycle shop once in a while, and thanks to Esme, she now has a job with the Ministry of Health as a community liaison officer. This is Okahanja Park, where Maureen lives with nine members of her family who all depend on her for their livelihood. Although it's not big enough for the whole family, Maureen is thankful that she has a roof over her head through an initiative of King's Daughters. They were selecting now people that they can donate houses and I was one of them. So they just built for two people, which is me and somebody else again, one lady, which is also part of King's Daughters. Even with the job she has now, she says it's not easy to look after a big family. At the moment, Maureen is the only one responsible for the whole family as she's the only one who has a job. I'm the only breadwinner here at the moment because my boyfriend doesn't work at the time and he's helping out with the household and the kids and everything. Well, the salary that I'm getting is not that enough but at least we can manage to have something at the end of the month to eat here. Maureen has been with her boyfriend for the past 10 years and he's the father of their two children. Maureen's sister also lives with her together with her boyfriend and their two kids. They too depend on her. Before I met her, she, she, she was this street sex work guy. But now she's doing better, she's changed, she's working now. And I'm happy for that. So I don't mind what she did at that time, but now I'm happy. Maureen had her firstborn son when she was only 15 years. With no money to take care of him, she had to find a quick way to make a living. I decided to uh, drop out of school and start to take care of my son because son, I didn't have school, I mean enough education and so for me it was very difficult to get another job. So I my friend introduced me to the prostitution is how I started. I was almost raped by two guys. Um, they picked me up and then both of them wanted to sleep with me and it was like behind the cemetery and it was dark, very dark and so I just lied to them that I have to go and then I ran. When I ran, lucky enough, I ran through the river and then they were chasing me with the car. Maureen's near-death experience prompted her to change her life. Now, once a week, she goes into town to try and convince the other girls to get off the sex industry. Maureen has an appointment to meet with the sex workers who act as mediators and give her the chance to speak to the prostitutes. Actually, they offered me that they can help me to recruit uh, others, but because they don't want to like get off from the street. And the other thing is that they are doing sex work, plus they have got their other jobs that they are doing as well. 
so I was like trying to recruit them but they say that they can't and they don't want to be off street with her mediators Marina approaches sex workers on the streets and offers them a chance at changing their lives through the King's daughters but today Maureen, who is in town ready to work, gets a call from one of the mediators. Um, she, she told me that um, she is out in Swakopmond and she won't be able to make it. I feel very disappointed, but there is nothing that I can do. Maureen's mission to recruit sex workers for rehabilitation has been aborted for now. And for these young ladies, it's business as usual. She will have to try another day and try her luck in reducing the trend of sex working in Namibia. Construction works at Palawana University in Chongwe District are moving at a snail's pace. President Michael Sata commissioned the construction works of the second university in Chongwe in May this year. Rocky terrain and poor government funding is hampering the project. Palawana Dairy Farm College is to be transformed into a university. On May 17, 2013, President Michael Sata led hundreds of people in witnessing the laying of the foundation stone for the construction of Palawana University. Four months later, a visit to the site indicate construction works are moving at a snail's pace, mainly on account of delayed government funding. Okay, but why are they not paying? What are they saying? Uh, yes, it is, but I'm trying, yeah, so I have to try all means, use our own money, we get the loan from the bank, mm. at least to let me, because we have to pay the work as first. No, the work that has been done, so otherwise people will complain. So. Lean and ill equipped staff sums up the story of a project facing some challenges. Completion of pillars at the main campus construction site is yet to finish, while the initial 10 lecturers' houses are yet to shape up as well. Datong Construction Company admits delayed government funding and the site's rocky terrain have hampered the process. Company Chief Executive Officer Mr. Su in a telephone interview expressed worry that if payments are not made expeditiously, it may affect the payment of workers' salaries. When reached for a comment over the delayed progress at Palabana, Education Minister John Piri was reluctant to give his position. Even a short one, huh? mm -hmm. However, Mike Mulongoti, former Works and Supply Minister, says government has a lot of projects which haven't been paid for. There are many contractors were complaining that they've not been paid the, all the billions. When we advised them that projects are never undertaken in a hazardous manner, we continue to tell them that they must be planned for, looking at the amount of money available in the treasury. But they thought we were jealousy and we didn't want to uh, make them do their work. What is done is that they went out and they dished out projects like Kimfeti. What has happened now is that they could have helped them with some mobilization resources. Now, completion certificates have come and there is chaos. There is no money to pay contractors. The consequence of that is that the contractors won't be able to pay their workers. The workers will be in the street and the so-called promised jobs that they were boasting about will be nothing. The upgrading of Palawana Dairy Institute is a welcome move. But what is clear is that the construction will not be done anytime soon if it continues at the current rate. See, the treasury is not a bottomless pit. There are other social needs that they are calling on the same little resources that are there. And the Zambian economy is not as large as they might have imagined when they went into office. They must have taken caution, exercise prudence, exercise careful planning. And I can tell you, 
alone the way you will see the consequence of this. The treasury, I do not think you would have the capacity to withstand the pressure on the demands that are going to come. But if they choose the easier way, by either printing money or jumping on the euro bond, the consequences will still come. Well, the euro bond is a debt which must be paid and so intended to be invested in the productive sector of the economy and not for consumption purposes. I know the chances that they are going to pounce on that if they have not already done that, which is very unfortunate. New female boxing sensation Catherine Peary faces another hurdle days after bagging her latest crown. Now Catherine may be receiving goodwill after winning the ABU Women Bantamweight title, but her desire is education. She will be among thousands of grade 9 pupils across the country writing their examinations. A round eight technical knockout was all Catherine Peary needed to back the Africa Boxing Union ABU Women Bantamweight title against Uganda's Tomahawa Babirie. Her latest victory adds to the World Professional Boxing Federation title she won last year. Catherine is now poised to go for the World Boxing Council WBC title. But before then, Catherine now has her eyes focused on the upcoming grade 9 examinations. After a period of absence from school to concentrate on winning the ABU title, Catherine returned to school on Thursday, 3rd October 2013. She received a hero's welcome from both teachers and her fellow pupils at school. Manager Chris Malunga was there to hand her over to the school authorities. She's back into school. Our motto must remain the same that she's a student now, she's not a champion. She should be treated the same way as others. And uh, please let's work together the way we have worked together to make sure that she passes her, her grade 9 exams. If it means uh, the same way of extra tuitions, she has to do it uh, because she has to pass. You know, it, it won't go well if you fail the exams for the school and even for us. The school administration is aware of the task ahead to adequately prepare Catherine for more successes, this time around in her grade 9 exams. And we are promising to do everything possible to make her pass her exams. We are going to ensure that we continue with her extra tuitions in the afternoons as the friends uh, may believe we're going to remain with her give her all she has missed all she needs to do she needs to do and uh, just help her pass the exams because we'll be happy if she passes the, the exams of course as a school we might not be happy if she doesn't do well so we'll do everything possible to ensure that uh, she just passes with good marks outside the boxing ring and the classroom Catherine is a second-born child in a family of six two brothers and three sisters. Before having an interest in boxing, Catherine first set off as a football player. Okay, I started boxing as a, it was like a joke, because uh, I, was, I, was, I, I used to stay here with my parents, and then I had to shift, I went to stay with my grandmother at Mandevu. That time I was playing football, and then I said, I was bored home, and then I was like, let me just go to the stadium, see if there, there's something I can find there. And then I went there, I didn't find the team. I only saw the boxing gym. People were training, boys and girls. I said, ah, let me see what they're doing there. Then I, when I walked in, into the gym, I found that it was boxing. And I, I was like, ah, even I can do it, let me try this one. And then I, I talked to Mr. Segaletti, the coach of the gym. He was like, ah, okay, come on Monday. What we, the only thing you need to do is to we buy the sneakers and the training kit, that's all. And then I went on Monday with the help of my uncle, Mr. Ahmed Sakara. He bought me everything and then I went to the gym. I was there and uh, I found ladies there, they, they were a competition in the gym. Her turn to boxing came as a surprise, not only to her father, but to herself as well. It was, it was about like maybe two years or three years when she has already started boxing. When did you find out about her? I was told when we were going for a family party, we were going to Chaminoka by then. And then that's when the mother told me that, do you know that Catherine is in boxing? And I said, oh, wow, I thought maybe 
that career is for, for men. Yeah, so I was a bit shocked. If I told he knew at first, I could have said, ah, no, 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 that is something else. But after I heard it, it was already too late. She has already started traveling to Chirirawombo, Livingstone. That's when I came to Nandi. By that time, she was already interested in boxing. Catherine's father, however, has other plans for her, like her being a nurse, as he fears some after effects of a boxing career. Yeah, worries were there. Uh, because, you know, in boxing, the most thing which uh, a person encounters after boxing is Parkinson's disease which is a very deadly disease to boxers. Once you have that disease, that's the end of it. I don't think there's any medication for that disease. So that was my worry, that if at all she continues, uh, maybe she'll en encounter Parkinson's disease. And I was thinking maybe, no, it's just part time. She won't take it serious. She will stop. But after being recognized by uh, uh, Oriental queries from Mr. Sekeleti, I, I saw that oh, this thing is now becoming uh, serious, it's big, okay? So the worry is still there because, uh, okay, if there's proper medication, that is okay. But if there's no proper medication, the worry still uh, lingers in the mind, saying that what if that disease uh, comes? Catherine is assured of her family's support in her rising boxing career a career which has not been devoid of ups and downs. My low point was uh, during this fight uh, when I won. Uh, I remember my dad wanted to, to give me a high to congratulate me and then my coach refused. That day I was not happy. Yeah, the saddest moment is, uh, you know, I know Catherine is, is being handled by other people, by Oriental Quarries. Okay, so when he's being handled by Oriental queries, I know I cannot be forgotten as a parent. Okay, and me being a parent, yes, there are other issues or other things which I cannot do better or I can wrong, but I am sure I deserve some, some discipline, some respect. Okay, like uh, what happened, uh, I wasn't happy uh, with uh, what the coach did, Mr. Mike Weaversville. I wasn't really happy. Uh, I was shouted, but uh, I just kept my my temper, and then I just came back home nicely. That was my, I think, my saddest moment in my life. How did you feel when she broke the news to you that she wants to go into boxing? Mm. <laughs> I was not happy. Mm. Mm. So, as time goes, eh, I started becoming happy. Anyway, no I feel just fine. For her being the champion, in it's just okay. Uh, but right like now, my friends have not yet discovered it. But some they know, but they keep on asking me, and I just answer them. She, she is my sister. Okay, you know these people nowadays, they might think like uh, it's just uh, maybe you are just boasting yourself. Get along and. As the family, we've always been giving her support. Yeah, and she really loves it when we are supporting her. Most of when she's in the ring, then we are busy screaming her name. She's really happy with it. Uh, okay, like when they hear like Keswin is a boxer champion, they think like we've got a lot of money, we are very rich, we can just give out. So we've got some challenges like we meet people, can I, help me with this amount, help me with that. However, Catherine sees her career span a few more years and is excited with the impending goal at a WBC title. I want to face the champion of the, the world champion, the one who is having the, the WBC belt from, uh, is it Australia? Australia, yes. Uh, Suze Lamadan. You think you can take her on? Yes, I can. The only thing I need is uh, proper training, proper camping. I can take her on. Me, my aim is when I get the WPC, when I get that belt, and then I'll defend maybe two or three times, I'll be done with boxing. She shares with the scoop one of her most difficult fights and where she gets her inspiration from. For Natalie Foger, it was the most difficult fight for me. Yeah, secondly, uh, when I fought uh, uh, Mr. Willy from Zimbabwe, that was the the, 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 the best in Livingstone because she was uh, 10 kg above different weight. 
Catherine is grateful to God and many other people beyond her family who have been there for her this far in her boxing journey. I also do fast toward the, the fight and uh, I pray every day and uh, I'm a praise member. And uh, also uh, the thanks go to the church for the support and they, they have been praying for me during the, the fight, fasting for me so that I can uh, win this fight. She is proud in doing household chores as she hopes one day to be married and start her own family. She adds that she is not immune from other household tasks that she has to do. She could beat the undefeated Zambian, but one strength she has is tenacity and ability to take unbelievably heavy beating and still go on. Catherine in line for a World Boxing Council title fight is just an ordinary young lady coming from an average Zambian family. Next week, as the dust of confusion seems to be settling, the PF remains a divided party in government than ever before. Embattled Party Secretary General Winter Kabimba has made stunning revelations of party divide on tribal lines. Analysts call for an amicable resolution of the wrangles with an admission that the PF will never be the same. Well, that's it for our program this week, but before we go, we leave you with the proverb of the week. And this week's proverb says, A leader who does not take advice is not a leader. A leader who does not take advice is not a leader. You can send us your interpretation of that proverb via our text line. All you have to do is type ASK, level space, type your message, and send it to 3322. We'll appreciate any feedback that we get from you. This is where we come to the end of our program. Till we meet again next week at the same time, thank you for the pleasure of your company. Goodbye.